During Cliff Pilkey's decade as president, the OFL continued to put forward proposals for job creation, occupational safety, housing, Medicare, strong labor laws, and publicly minded economic policies. But faced with unprecedented unemployment and inflation, the Federation had an internal enemy to combat, the scapegoating of the most vulnerable workers in society, in the workplace, and in the union. More women and racialized workers were being subjected to humiliation and horrific work conditions. More were organizing and fighting back. They were saying no to discrimination and exploitation. In March 1978, 80 low-paid workers at Fleck Manufacturing near London, Ontario boldly went on strike for sanitary workplaces, livable wages, job safety, and an end to rampant sexual harassment. And another girl, Kathy, she asked him, you know, she says, I'm getting hurt. She said, I'm scared of really getting hurt. And he says, well, he says, do you want to work or don't you? That's how they solved our health problems and our safety problems. And God damn it, that's the time when you better speak up. You might be, you know, mouthy and speak up for yourself and get what you want. I was in that position, I could do it. But then you better start looking around, you better start speaking up for those other girls too. And that's how the union was born, really, in that plant. After six months, the flex strike was won. That victory emboldened the newly formed OFL Women's Committee and the wider labor movement to press for mass changes in labor laws on employment equity, pay equity, child care, parental rights, and more. Women were underrepresented in union leadership, so the OFL made a change. If we maintain the structure that was in place at the time, that very few women uh, would get an opportunity uh, to uh, participate in, 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 on the executive board in a leadership role within the Federation. I propose to our board that we add uh, five positions that would be women's positions. The convention was nearly unanimous uh, in, in uh, endorsing that. While the OFL push for affirmative action was gaining ground, workers of color were pushing back against racism. Wes Kaysen, a library worker at the University of Toronto, had not been promoted in 18 years. But when he grieved over racial harassment, he found little support from his co-workers. If you look in the University of Toronto management, you find very few minorities. If you look at the governing council of the University of Toronto, you find very few minorities, especially the governing council. They're all white males and females. Uh, the library administration, all white males and females. Uh, there is nowhere in the structure of the University of Toronto where you will find that many ethnics in any position of authority. In 1981, in response to increasing racial tensions, violent incidents, and employer practices of divide and rule, the OFL launched a province-wide media campaign with the TV ad, Racism Hurts Everyone. A message from the Ontario Federation of Labour and your local Labour Council. Two years later, they followed up with a systematic member education campaign led by June Vicock. Racism goes against two fundamental principles of the labor movement, which are fair shares and solidarity. Uh, racism strikes at the heart, both of those principles. Uh, it weakens our unions, it, it separates us, it divides us. And uh, when we are divided, we don't make gains. At one steelworkers plant, racism had brought co-workers to a fist fight. With the OFL support, they turned the situation around and to their advantage. At this time right now, we're, we're getting ready to negotiate with the company and uh, just uh, looking at the turnouts of their meetings and the participation that went into that. We were getting full houses all the time. So those people are coming closer to the union and we are becoming a little bit more solid day by day. 